What are the first words that children learn? <laughs> Dada, mama, no. And the next one is mine. My, more. They quickly learn the words mine, my, and more. And I just love, you know, Christmas, you get, a lot, get to be with a lot of kids and a lot of family gatherings. And I just love how children do this when they're playing with their little toys or they become their treasures. And you'll just notice how they create these little kingdoms and they pull all the toys around themselves. And they just, and the other child comes close and they go, mine, <laughs> mine, right? And I know adults that are still like that, by the way. <laughs> and so because we're in the Christmas season for, for, uh, for the month of December, I thought we would do this whole series on sharing everything, talking about what is a biblical perspective on generosity and on wealth and how should we live. The truth is you are supposed to be a model to the world. And we're supposed to be the kinds of men and women that the rest of the world looks up to. And our goal for the whole series is living above your circumstances in every circumstance. And I'd like us to read our monthly uh, scripture, Proverbs 11, 24. It's on the screen. Let's go ahead and read that together. Ready? Go. One person is generous and yet grows more wealthy, but another withholds more than he should and comes to poverty. You have met people in your life that are never satisfied, and you have met people in your life that are incredibly content. And their, their personal wealth has nothing to do, generally speaking, with whether or not they are at peace or they are content. It's all about something that's happening within the individual. And we were made by God to be the kind of people that walked in that confidence and walked in a way that we did not look like we were striving every day of our life, like we were miserable. There's a contentment in the strong, mature Christian, and it makes the world look at you and wonder what you have that they need. And if you do this discipline well, you have no issues with sharing because you're not afraid that God cannot be the one who restores what you give away. But if you're so worried about holding everything close to you, like that little child that surrounds itself, everybody becomes your competitor. And so as soon as someone gets close, mine, mine, mine. And we are called not to be those people. And quite frankly, parents, you know, you have to train your children to share. There are rare exceptions, and God bless you if you got one of those. But the rest of us had to train our children how to share, how to be gracious, how to give. And so on this journey of this month of sharing everything, we're going to take kind of baby steps along the way and see what the Bible says to us about understanding this perspective and how to live every day above our circumstances. And today, we're going to talk about freedom to flourish. Freedom to flourish. Flourish is used throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, that word flourish. The Greek is anatholo, which means to receive, to shoot up, to sprout again. Hebrew is parak, to bud, to break out. The entire, me the entire word has within it kind of an agricultural meaning. Specifically, it is talking about a seed. How many of you in school, when you were little, they gave you a bean seed to take home and made you try to grow it? Anybody remember that? Yeah. It was so cool because you'd put it maybe in a wet napkin or in a cup or something, and you'd watch the, watch the little roots come out, and you had to plant it in a little styrofoam cup. And then, you know, you're just wondering as a child, is this thing dead? Is it alive? Right? Because you don't know. It's in the cup. It's buried. And then one day, a little leaf pops out. I remember, I, I don't know how old I was, I remember when my little leaf popped out. Yes, I didn't kill it. It's alive. That 
moment that it sprouts is what flourish means. It's beginning the process of having a fruitful life. And so understanding that we have the freedom to flourish means that God has an intention that our lives will be like that bean, like that seed. But it's important to separate what God means by flourishing and what the world means by flourishing. And the first point of your notes, cultural flourishing differs from biblical flourishing. Cultural flourishing differs from biblical flourishing. The cultural flourishing is like the world view. And let me just give you a simple statement about what that means. This is a cultural view, a world view of flourishing. That the world is made to serve you. You are a consumer only and not a provider. Others are here to serve you, provide for you. The universe was made to satisfy your desires and satiate your soul. That's a world view. I was reading a really uh, interesting article in Psychology Today. Uh, they had done this uh, study in, the, in a university uh, in, in um, Hungary. Hungary it was. And it talked about narcissists or selfish, the selfish brain, the narcissist brain, the Machiavellian brain, the Machiavellian brain. Uh, that comes from, uh, Machiavellian comes from a guy, an Italian guy in the 14th century, Niccolo Machiavelli. And, and he was trying to get power in Florence. And there was a, a powerful family called the Medici family. And they were cast out for a while, and he tried to get power over this community, to be a politician over the community. And what happened was they came back in, kicked him out of power, tortured him, and sent him away in exile. And he wrote a book called The Prince. And this book is famous, and unfortunately, I'd say it's infamous, because every politician, it's like required reading. And The Prince is all about finding the base attributes of humanity and taking advantage of people in an unscrupulous way in order to gain for yourself. And it is basically uh, saying that if I can work on your fears and your selfishness or on your greed, if I can cause problems between uh, individuals, I will use all of those so that I can have an increase. It's a narcissistic, selfish attitude. The prince. And what this study found is people who have selfish tendencies, that kind of a narcissistic tendency, they actually do have a season of growth. They do grow for a while. They do make wealth for a while. They do become pretty powerful public figures for a while. But if you live in that lifestyle, the vast majority of them die broke and alone. The end is death. And so we have to be careful as we talk about God flourishing us. There is a worldview that is enticing. It's like eating, if I get up for breakfast and I'm hungry, I could have an egg or I could have a piece of cake. Which do you think I choose? The cake, yeah, absolutely, man. <laughs> Unfortunately, many times I do. But the truth is, if the cake, I have the cake, you know, half hour later, I'm hungry again. I have a crash, right? But if I were to have the nutritional protein of an egg, it lasts me till lunchtime. And so it's the same thing. The danger is, is we pray to God as Christians that he would help us and he would, we would flourish in our life. The cultural worldview is like the sweets or the cake. You will gain benefits by taking advantage of people for a while. But in the end, you die alone and broke. And the world doesn't realize it's pursuing an empty promise. The way the world defines wealth is to be like that child. Build yourself a kingdom and put your arms around it and say, mine, mine, and spend your life protecting your little treasures. And it is completely opposite of what the biblical worldview is, a biblical 
view of flourishing is. And God has a way for us to discipline ourselves to understand what it means to have a biblical perspective of generosity and wealth and the comfortability of sharing everything. If we look at biblical flourishing, it involves our entire self, which includes psychological, spiritual, and emotional and material aspects. We are told in Philippians 2.3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. It's just the opposite of a narcissist. But look at what Deuteronomy 28.13 says. It says, and this is for biblical flourishing, the Lord will make you the head, not the tail, if. There's an if in there. Let's pay attention to the if. The Lord will make you head and not the tail if you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them. That's an action verb. Don't just read them, but follow them, and you will always be at the top and never at the bottom. What he's doing is he's setting us up to live a supernatural lifestyle where, where the world is completely confounded and confused by the fact that you have contentment, that you have success, that you have, uh, you have provision, that, you, that, that God is working through you wherever you go. And they're confused by that because you're the kind of person that's happy, that loves people, that's humble, that shares. How could you do so well and share so much? I've, I've told this story many times about how when I was a young person trying to start a business, I had a business guy that lived off a of 10% and gave away 90%. And at that time, in my young, immature brain, I thought, I want to do that too. I want to make so much money that I don't care about giving away 90%. I'll still have my massive 10% for me. And I totally didn't get the story, right? Until I met some, a, couple, a couple people that lived the same way, but they didn't have to amass a fortune. They simply said, God, you are a God of abundance. And they live in such a spirit of generosity, God trusts them with an abundance. And they're constantly giving their love away, their friendships away, they're giving their stuff away. I mean, they're constantly giving, 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 and they always seem to have an abundance because of the spirit of giving. They are living out what Scripture says. They are living out biblical flourishing, and they have much, much more than someone with more quote-unquote, money in the bank because they are going to the ultimate resource that never runs out and never runs dry. That's biblical flourishing, but, it's, but it comes with an if. And God wants us to know the ifs are good for us. My daughter gets, still gets mad at me because I, when, when, I, when they were in school, I wanted them to go to college, and I knew that to get money, you had to have a certain GPA. And my, and I, and my daughter had to get a 3.5, okay? So I s used to sing the song to her. When she turned 15 and a half and she wanted to get the license, I'd say, 3.5 or you don't drive. 3.5 or you don't drive. <laughs> she hated that song. She tells me that all the time. I hated it when you did that. 3.5 or you don't drive. Well, she, if that, was, that worked because she knew until she got 3.5, she didn't drive. I had friends that, like, that said to me, I would have never have driven if you were my dad. I said, <laughs> fine. I save a lot of money that way. And so there's an if to stuff. And there's nothing wrong with the if. The if is good for us. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God, then you'll be on the top and not the bottom. So biblical flourishing has to be a commitment to following the commands of Jesus. That's how it works. And like the seed, let's think about the seed for a minute. Which is the wiser farmer? Let's say a farmer has 200 acres and they want to have an apple farm. One farmer takes a seed and he plants that one seed in the center of the 200 acres. And his plan is this, that that's going to grow in about 15 years into a tree. That tree is going to produce about 100 apples. Then I'm going to harvest those apple seeds and plant some more. And then you know, I'll wait another 15 years and I'll have more trees. And more. I mean, it'll take the guy 100 years to have an orchard. He's doing it by himself on his own. 
What this is saying is biblical flourishing is understanding God is the ultimate resource and you are sharing. The wise farmer took lots of people together and got lots of seeds and he planted 200 acres of seeds. And then those trees grew so much fruit that they were able to sell the fruit and make a living and pay for the farm and raise their families because they had created a harvest. And that's the point. Flourishing means that you're, this is your life. Your life goes from the beginning to the roots to, to uh, coming out of the ground and becoming a plant, then producing fruit, and that fruit, fr fruit produces seeds, which also produces plants, which produces fruit, which produces seeds. That's biblical flourishing. And we're called to do it together, and when we do it together and we're generous with one another, as a team, we have a beautiful orchard quicker, and we can have a great harvest, and we can help more people. But if you try to do it alone, the sitting there with your treasures, mine, 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 you'll have something, but you'll not have everything. When you serve God, guess what? You are heirs to everything God has. So people who are heirs to a God who has, have everything aren't afraid or challenged by generosity because they have great wealth. It is in the one whom they serve. And the beautiful thing about Christmas season, about December, is it's a worldwide party about Jesus. And if, even if people don't like it, they don't want to say it, they don't appreciate it. They're forced for the entire month. Actually, uh, after Halloween now, they're forced to think about Christmas, right? Because Christmas is there. And it's giving us an opportunity to show the world what it means to be generous as Christians. Secondly, everyone has the potential to flourish. All of us have the potential to flourish. This saying has always been dear to my heart. We were created by God in the image of God for the purpose and pleasure of God. It's nice to know that you were made by someone who loves you, that cares about you, and has great pleasure that you exist. And it makes us want all the more to serve God because you love God and you know He loves you and He takes pl great pleasure in knowing that He created you. But all of us have the potential to flourish Galatians 3.28, if you take it in the context of the day, was a powerful statement. It says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Remember, the early church was flourishing with a Roman empire around it, and they were the minorities, and they were not taken seriously, and they were mistreated. But in that place where the Romans had all the power, all the authority, all the money, and the Christians had very little, he is saying in the very beginning to those who are being hurt, those, those who are being persecuted, those who are being devalued, he's saying there is equal value to every human being. Christ came for all. Colossians 3.11 says, Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and in all. Here's the point. Jesus only had to die once. And when he died, he died for every nation. Christianity isn't for one nation, and it isn't for one people group. Christianity is for everyone, lest Christ has to die again. Would he have to come back and die again for this country or that country or this country or that people? He only had to sacrifice himself once for all humanity, which allows all humanity to receive the fullness of the forgiveness of Christ. And sure, our methods change with the nations and our languages and our cultures, but the message never changes. This is the beauty of Christianity. You know, unlike a lot of people, I am not fearful or afraid when so many come to our nation 
and they bring with them their religions. I am not fearful of other religions. Some are Buddhist, Hindu, polytheistic, Islam, Taoist. We have, by the way, we've created our very own here in the United States, a huge one called humanism. We've created a giant religion here called humanism. We need not fear any other religion because they are all the same. If you take some time and think about it, people are on a journey. They're trying to reach God, nirvana, or enlightenment. They're on a journey. Everybody's on some kind of a journey trying to find what they're missing. And so they're using rules, regulations, and rituals to get there. Every other religion uses rules, regulations, and rituals to try to find a way to get to that place that they know they're supposed to be and they can't quite figure out how to get there. And they can never get there with a rule or a regulation or a ritual. However, Christianity is different. God looked down upon his creation and he says, I love you so much. I am going to help you. I am going to bring restoration. I am going, I, God, am going to share everything. I'm going to share my son with you. And he sends Jesus to earth. A child in the flesh carrying the pure blood of the living God. No sin in this child. And he sends down to earth this child. And this child goes through life without sin and becomes Jesus. And Jesus takes it upon himself to go to the cross and to allow himself to be crucified on the cross to shed his innocent blood so that we can accept the forgiveness of our sin by his innocent blood shed for us. And then Jesus did not stay dead. Other religions have leaders who are dead and did not raise from the dead. Jesus did not stay dead. Jesus rose from the dead to show us he has power to forgive our sins and power to give us new eternal life. But none of that, those of you who are Christians, you did not buy your way into Christianity it didn't come through a, a ritual, a regulation, or a rule. It was a free gift given to you by God that you chose to accept. That is the difference between Christianity and every other religion. You can't buy it and you can't earn it. God, instead of man trying to reach up to God, God reached down to man with his son, and he shared everything. And he gave us the opportunity to have forgiveness of our sins by accepting the free gift of the sacrificed Christ, God's only son. Amen. And so I say to you, everyone has the potential to flourish. And as you meet men and women from different nations and with different religions, don't be afraid or fearful when you share the concept of this, it will blow their mind. If they listen, if they're willing to listen, they will see the distinction between trying to earn something and as opposed to receiving something from the very one they are attempting to follow. It is, it is beautiful. And Christmas just gives us one more excuse to have that conversation. Third, biblical flourishing spreads God's glory. Our growth increases our effectiveness in sharing the good news. I am so touched by this particular portion of Scripture in Jeremiah. Because God had allowed his people, through their, because of their sin, to be exiled into Babylon. So here they are, exiled into a foreign land with a people that did not serve their God because of their own sin, by the way. But God, even in their sin, loves them so, so much that he had a plan of redemption for them. He had a plan to restore them, to take them out of that mess, to speak hope into them, because God is always in the restoration business. And maybe you're coming into a Christmas season where you just feel like, my life's a mess. Well... 
That's kind of what God does for a living. He cleans up messes. That's why he sent Jesus to earth. He didn't send, us, send Jesus here because we're all well, well and healthy and happy. He knew we were a mess. And he sent Jesus to clean up the mess. And so, but look what happens. Here's these people in exile, and here's God speaking through Jeremiah the prophet. And he says this in chapter 29, 4 through 7. Listen to how beautiful this is. The Lord God of Israel, who rules over all, says to all those he sent into exile to Babylon from Jerusalem, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons. Allow your daughters to get married so they too can have sons and daughters. Grow in numbers. Do not dwindle away. Work to see that the city where I sent you as exiles enjoys peace and prosperity. Pray to the Lord for it, for as it prospers, you will prosper. What he's saying is, you are in a land where they're not your people, they don't serve your God, they don't have your values, they don't have your belief system, and I want you to be successful in that city. I want you to pray for that city. I want you to pray for those very leaders who dislike you because of your faith. I want you to pray a blessing over those leaders. I want you to pray a blessing over its economy, over the business people. Bless them. Bless them, because if you bless them, and if you live your life expecting God to bless you, you will be an example of what it means to follow the living God. You will be an example of biblical flourishing. Now, our environment has changed so that we have access to social media. And let me give you a little insight on this. We used to have to write letters, and read, letters would take a little time to get to, get to you, right? And, and now you don't have to write any letters. You can simply, with a, with a, in the privacy of your own home, insult somebody publicly through Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. You can privately insult somebody publicly with a quick text or, or a quick email or a quick social post. But here's the problem. Here's the challenge. If we want to live in a prosperous world, if we want God to bless people, they will define you by the things you say, the stuff that you post. It will define you. And you know who else is watching you? Tens of thousands of marketers who are marketing products. I would joke with my wife that if I was on Safari or, or the Internet looking for solar systems for my house, boom, Facebook, all these solar systems come up on the side. Right? If we're looking for a car, boom, cars come up on the side. The exact car that I was talking about. Listen, people are watching you. Marketers are watching you. They're defining you by the stuff you look at and what you say. And is what you're saying leading other people to an understanding of what it means to be a Christian, or are they leading them somewhere else? Will they look at your posts and what you view and what you repost as someone who loves their city, loves their nation, prays for their leaders, or someone that is not godly of an example. You represent everything. It says, work to see that the city where I sent you. He's saying, the city I sent you, with is, which is godless and doesn't worship with me, I want you to work hard so there'd be peace and prosperity in that city. And the promise he makes is, Pray for it, because as it prospers, you will prosper. That means that God has an expectation that as you live out a life of biblical flourishing, God will be seen in you. Christ, the Christian lifestyle will be seen with you, and people will scratch their head and say, how come everybody else is complaining and whining and saying bad things, and you're praying, and you're finding common ground with people, and making friends, and influencing people in the name of Jesus. That is why we must believe fully that we are called to flourish in a biblical sense because it represents God's glory to a lost and dying world. And if you truly believe that God is your resource, then you're not afraid to be generous. 
you're not afraid to share because you know your wealth comes from God. That's the point he's making. So biblical flourishing spreads God's glory to a dark and dying world. And flourishing is complete when Jesus returns. Flourishing doesn't get done. Your flourishing doesn't get done until Jesus comes back. There's the now and there's the later. In the now, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24 says this, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. So, we need to understand that he wants us to do well now. He wants us to be blessed now. He wants us to be an example of contentment now. He wants to provide an abundance of provision for us now. The promise is now, but the promise is also for later. It's the now and the later. In 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 4, it says this, For we know that if our earthly house, the tent we live in, is dismantled, our body, we have a building from God, a house not built by human hands, that is eternal in the heavens. For in this earthly house we groan, because we desire to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed, after we have put on our heavenly house, we will not be found naked, for we groan while we are in, his t- in this tent, since we are weighed down, because we do not want to be unclothed, but clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. There is no worries for the Christian about our life after we die. And most most other religions, whether it's believing there's a heaven or a nirvana or an enlightened place, they're still not sure of what's going to happen when they die. They hope, they hope that they've lived a good enough life that maybe the afterlife will be better or maybe that they won't be sent back as a dog or a cockroach or something. It's, it's, a, it's a real concern for people. They really don't know what's going to happen after they die. Only the Christian knows that there's an expectation that if you live your life for Jesus, God will care for you now, and he will absolutely care for you in the hereafter. That you will serve him for all eternity. That is a beautiful promise that we have been given as the Christian. I'd like to ask the prayer teams if they'd come up right now. I'm a little bit early on this, but just come up here, prayer team, and I'd like the, the worship team to come up on stage right now. I've got a few more things to say, but I just want to get you here for me. Because we only, get, we only get this season once a year. The opportunity where the world has to look at Christ, has to look at Jesus. They try to change it up, call it the holiday season, put Santa Claus in. I get all that, but don't worry about it. God will work that out. He always does. But we've been given a great opportunity once a year to take advantage of the fact that there's a worldwide party that's about to happen called Christmas where they are forced to celebrate an event that happened that changed human history forever, the coming of the Messiah. And I've got a couple of scriptures here I'm going to give you that I want you to, that I'm going to put them in your notes every, every week for the rest of the year. I want you to remember these and have these because I truly believe you're going to get a chance to tell someone about your faith this season. The first one is 1 John 1, 9, which says, But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous, forgiving us our sins and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. What a beautiful scripture. And the second one, Romans 10, 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the free gift. That's what Christ did for us. Would you bow your heads for a second? I just feel like right now, I just want to say something. During communion, I felt like there was maybe one or two or maybe five, I don't know, people here. If you came here today and you know, today is your day to get right with Jesus. You know it. And you know how to do it can't earn it through some ritual. It's a gift from God. You just simply need to accept it. God's offering you that gift right now. 
Do you want forgiveness of your sins? Do you want a new life? Do you want to be right with Jesus? If that's you, while everybody's praying here with their heads bowed, just raise your hand right now. Say, Pastor, that's me. I've decided today I'm going to get right with Jesus. Let me see your hand. Let me see your hand. Okay, good. Who else? Yes, I see you over there. Who else? Come on. It's hard to see because of the lights. Put your hand up high for me. Okay, good. Good, you can put your hands down now. Now listen to me. When we're done, I want you to be courageous and take one more step. And just come to the front and say, you know what? I've decided today's my day. And let them pray for you. They've got something to help you on your walk with Jesus. We didn't, none of us did this alone. We did this as a family. So if you said yes to Jesus today, just tell someone so we could say, let's pray for you. And we can make sure you don't walk this walk out alone. And for the rest of us, this is a season of generosity. Not to get yourself in debt, but to remember the gift that you were given, we should give it away. You can't give enough Jesus away. You don't run out of Jesus to give people. The more you give, the more he gives you. Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving for all eternity. And so I'm going to ask you to make sure during this Christmas season that you open your hearts and you listen with the Holy Spirit and you tell people about Jesus. Amen? Let's all stand together. We're going to sing a final song. Pastor Dale is going to give us a benediction. And then I'm going to see you out there in the APR. And Merry Christmas. Let's sing.